We have, I, I think, a special treat with us today, and I guess I've said that always, but I think that's just because we've done a pretty good job of bringing in good people. And today we're fortunate to have with us Jeffrey Lynn Sermon, who grew up as one of six children on a family farm in Swan Valley, Idaho. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Brigham Young University in 1982. Three years later, in 1985, he completed graduate school with a Master of Public Administration degree from BYU. Uh, Jeff began his credit union career in 1976 as a student employee of BYU Employees Credit Union. And just an aside, that's where I started my banking career with my first deposits, uh, as my father worked at BYU, and so I have many fond memories of that institution. Uh, the credit union has grown quickly, and they offered job and, uh, Jeff an opportunity to work in every department of the credit union. As it grew, he, it, its name was changed to, its current name is UCCU, Utah Community Credit Union. He served there as a loan officer, a branch manager, a vice president of services, vice president of lending, and executive vice president. In February of 2003, Jeff was named president and, C, and CEO of UCCU. He's a graduate of the CUNA Management School at Pomona College. He served as a board member of the Utah League of Credit Unions. He served as a board member on many community organizations, including the Provo Orem Chamber of Commerce, the IHC Health Foundation, and currently serves as a board member of the United Way of Utah. He is an advisory board member for UVU's nationally noted Center for the Advancement of Leadership. He's also served as, an, as a member of the advisory board of the National Association of Federal Credit Unions a member of the NAFCU Governmental Affairs Committee and is currently a member of the Credit Union Executive Society. And I think one of the things that you notice about uh, pretty much everybody that we've brought into this executive lecture series is that they've taken their success in their careers and they've translated that into career service as well. And Jeff is no exception to that rule. And I, I think that's a, that's a very honorable thing and something to take notice of as you begin to progress in your careers, that, that sense of community involvement and giving back to the community. Aside from these activities, Jeff has also been a speaker at BYU Campus Education Week and a presenter for CES programs such as Know Your Religion and Best of Especially for Youth. He is a musician and songwriter and has published two LDS CDs. Jeff and his wife Debbie are the parents of five children and eight grandchildren and live in American Fork, Utah. So without further ado, I present to you Mr. Jeff Sermon. Great to be with you today. Uh, one thing that uh, Dr. Wright didn't mention is when he withdrew his savings after he graduated, the credit almost closed down because <laughs> you had so much there and uh, student days are great. Well, uh, as was mentioned, I've been with the credit union for some time and watched it. I, uh, when I started, there were seven of us, the total employees. So seven people, that was our staff meeting and we never dared dream uh, of, of what was maybe possible. And so one thing I'd want to instill in each of you is you have your dreams, don't let them go. And when things seem to be impossible, could it really turn out this way? Could this really happen? The answer is yes. And not always as fast as we want, but certainly as you have, the, as you have vision, and the, the world today, business world, uh, society in general, needs visionary people. And so don't stop dreaming. And uh, I want to just touch on some things today. I don't know how you make financial services interesting, fun, exciting as going to a concert or, or something like that. So I won't try to do that. But hopefully we can talk about some things today. If you have questions, it's a little bit difficult for me to see, but if you'll wave, wave your hand or whatever, we want to talk about things and, and have a, a two-way dialogue here as much as we can. The financial industry uh, is, a, is the backbone of, of business and of, of countries and uh, the way it impacts the lives and the way the government impacts it and all those other kinds of things are, are right at the forefront right now. Um, just wanted to, one of the things that, uh, a question that will come up is, so what's wrong, what happened? And we don't have time here to talk about what led to this recession, what led to the financial, I think you've probably, unless you have major questions about that. It's a combination, some call it a perfect storm, of a lot of things that happened. Uh, credit being too easy to get, uh, you know, the, everyone having the American dream to have a home. You could apply for a home, be approved for it, and not even prove that you had a job, let alone how much money you made. Uh, government programs that, uh, that pursued that goal of everyone. Uh, home ownership went up to high as 70%, typically just above 50. 
And so a lot of people did have homes. And then uh, since the, the, the problems have come and a lot of homes, there's four million homes uh, right now available in America. There's another five million that are at are ready to go into foreclosure. And so you okay, what, uh, you know, what's wrong and, 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 and how bad is it? Two of the questions, and, and when, how long is it going to end? Or when is it going to end? How long is it going to last? We're uh, in several months past when recessions are supposed to be over. How many of you feel the recession in your personal lives? Okay. How, how do you sense it in the blue shirt with a white tie there? Well, it's pretty obvious, the fact of, uh, raises. Okay. A lot of companies haven't had raises for two or three years. Some companies have cut pay to keep jobs. Anyone else? How's the recession affected you personally? Yes, up here. Um, I think morale, just in, in working industries, just really declined. It was really difficult. People talked about it. Was really okay, you're looking for a job day after day. It gets pretty old, and you start feeling kind of, am I worth anything? Have I got any skills anybody wants? A lot of college students are asking, I'm going to college getting this education. Are there going to be jobs? <laughs> when I finish, is there going to be a job for me? And so it, it does impact us, and if nothing else, we just worry about it. And we see families and, uh, and members and friends and people we know. Uh, did you hear Hungary is being overrun by toxic red sludge? And the other guy says, well, uh, they're probably better off just ignoring it. And it seems like some of these problems that are built in, you know, Social Security, all those kinds of things, that we just kind of ignore them. Maybe the next generation can deal with that. And if you do that long enough, things pile up and stack up enough, and you, and you have uh, kind of the situation like we have today. And we talk about numbers that are just unbelievable. You know, what a billion is. And uh, if you start counting to a billion, one, two, three, it'll take you 97 years to reach a billion. A trillion dollars, if you're uh, going to lay down one uh, a dollar bill every second, do you know how long it'll take you to count out a billion dollars? 37,000 years. <laughs> and these are numbers that just fly around and they don't have to, and they don't make a lot of sense to us because you can't relate them with our day. Just want to show a video now uh, about what a trillion dollars is. to be rich and you need somebody baby you can ring ring a ring for the man money, 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 but money. does your life have greater importance depending on the money in your pocket the clothes that you wear and the people that you pay the peeps that you pay money 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 makes the world go round money 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 makes the world go round if you happen to be rich and you're left by your lover you can always recover on your 100 foot yacht money, money. to be rich and you feel like a party in a night of dancing you can pay to have your favorite band play money 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 are you aware can you hear do you see the birds are free and the message that they say money 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 makes the world around money 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 makes the world around money money ah oh, money money are uh, whatever combination, and uh, you've probably discussed that or had case studies, what's led us to the recession, and I won't take more, more time with that, only to tell you what you probably already know. It's the worst recession of our lifetime. I hope it's the worst recession of your lifetime. The worst one in my lifetime prior to this was the end of 79, 80. 
uh, interest rates. Inflation was 17, 18%. You're lucky to get a 14% mortgage loan. We were paying 18% on CDs for people to save. And it got so bad and out of control with inflation that the Carter Credit Restraint Program was put into place. And that was a law from the federal government that didn't allow us to make over $500 open-end credit loans. You couldn't loan over $500. It's just too much money out there, too easy to get. And even at those kinds of rates, it didn't slow enough down, slow it down enough. And so we had laws that uh, uh, regulated how much we could loan out. We'd love to have those days in some ways uh, now, but inflation is what generally will follow the kind of spending that we've seen happen. The perfect the piece they're putting put into place right now, the perfect setup for there to be super or hyper inflation. And there's government programs and they're watching all of that, but right now they're not worried about inflation as much as they are what's happening in the economy. Certainly the worst recession of our lifetime. If I can get this, trillions of dollars of wealth have just disappeared. And then get stolen by somebody. Uh, it just disappeared. Yes, there were people who got wealthy and got out at the right time, but values in homes, values in stock market portfolios, trillions of dollars has just disappeared. Uh, people's ability to earn, as was mentioned earlier, that hits the wealth. Over eight million jobs lost just in a couple of years. Many people say they're not gonna come back or that only part of them will. And you know the global economy and you've probably talked about that and where the jobs go, who's doing them, what kind of policies the government should or shouldn't have or can or can't have that, uh, that influence, where the jobs are. 9.6 unemployment's been over, actually over 9.5 for over 14 months. Has it been higher? Yes, in the Great Depression. Uh, the, uh, the unemployment rate in Utah has actually been higher than it is in that recession I referred to, but it wasn't as, as long. Over 4 million homes are now on the market. Over 5 million homes are at or going through foreclosure. That's uh, about, uh, they figure there's five to six trillion dollars of mortgage debt that's ready to, to, to crumble. Uh, confidence in government, business has plummeted. You maybe have some of those thoughts. Can the government fix it? It used to be, should the government try to fix it? How much should the government get involved in business? And uh, there's lots of discussion about that, but can the government? You know, their Fed fund rate has been zero to 0.25 for over two years to try to free up money. You still hear, well, people can't get credit. We're sitting on $200 million, just in our size institution, that we can't loan out to people. And so it's invested. And uh, for a lot of different reasons, people aren't borrowing. Small businesses that can borrow are choosing not to. They cite government regulation, uncertainty about tax structures, et cetera. They're not sure if the other shoe's gonna fall. And then we have the W kind of, of uh, recovery that we fall back into another recession. And uh, things are pretty delicate. But the good news is, with all of that bad news, according to Mayan calendar, on December 21st, 2012, all the agony will be over. <laughs> You can just hang in there for two more years and struggle through all of this and it's all gonna go away, yeah, right. Uh, government conundrum. Will Rogers said, the bad thing about Congress is they never get anything done. Then he finished his quote, the good thing about Congress is they never get anything done. <laughs> and there's a lot of people right now who are hoping that with this election there'll be enough gridlock that Congress will slow down what it's doing because the steps that they're taking. Uh, you know, and make sure that in, in their efforts to fix things that they, they do the right things. Uh, some people talk about the government, hey, we're here to help, and do they make things better or worse? Certainly they set a lot of important policies, but can they start interfering with that process? And there's a lot of debate, in fact, the elections are about that kind of thing. I like the person who said that the government scratching goes on well past the time the itching has stopped. <laughs> that there tends to be, we can come in and fix a, a program that the Federal income tax was supposed to be a temporary tax. That uh, a lot of times when the government gets involved, that uh, it, it continues on, and sometimes will get worse. And uh, then business does its own share. Is there greed in business? Are there losers and cheats and frauds in business? Yeah. And so the government, so we've got to do something to try to uh, create a framework where businesses can. Say hi to Dave, he's our tech guy. He's trying to keep everything safe and keep the buzzes out of the way. Hi Dave, thanks, okay. So uh, a lot of people uh, worried about uh, what government's doing. We have a leader, a lot of momentous things. 
Um, some people uh, claim that he's going too far too fast. Some people claim he's not doing enough to try to help out. I don't know where you sit with that, but all these things that we're looking at with the government and how do we help, and as, as bad and dismal, I, there's several things that, uh, that he ran against with, with the Bush, but he shares them, unfortunately, with him, and that's the, still the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, the, the, the troubles in the economy, still he has those to, to try to continue to deal with. He even shares Bush's approval ratings now. You know, so, uh, but before you despair, at least uh, we're not England. <laughs> Anybody here from England? I apologize to you. I just, this was a great shot. I thought, you know, we all have our leaders and our worries and stuff like that. So a lot of people say, well, we'll, we'll take Obama. He'll be just fine. Uh, in the midst of a recession like this and all the turmoil that's out there and the, uh, the worry about uh, tax policy, monetary policy, the government now is doing quantitative easing phase two, which means they're buying their own debt and, and pouring a lot more money out there trying to keep the economy from sagging into another recession. And so when you're trying to run a business or a family or go to school, you know, we still have to live and the sun comes up. And so there's a lot of things, especially uh, emphasized by a recession, that we have to deal with here. So the whole way you do business, the way companies are put together, uh, trying to preserve capital. Businesses are, are, are going under all around us. They're out of capital. Their rainy day savings fund has now been spent. It's gone. And so you try to preserve that, manage expenses, cut costs. Uh, sometimes that means laying off people. Sometimes that means uh, uh, cutting uh, uh, benefits in your job. Um, there's an uh, all-new economy. Uh, it's going to be slower growth, and even when it recovers, most economists uh, agree that it's going to be a slow, arduous recovery, and that the new normal is going to, what's normal is going to change. A lot of the things that people are doing to get through this recession will be the new normal. It's what they'll have to do after the recession to remain viable as a company. Uh, families, the same way. Uh, regulatory change, boy, they're coming down the pike, and everybody's getting on the, uh, you know, passing laws as fast as they can. Some of them without being read, some without knowing all the unintended consequences. If we had time, I could tell you about a couple of those uh, and uh, that they're just happening so fast. A risk and fraud management in a recession, you have to worry about both of those getting worse. And people say, well, I'm going to find some money somehow, and so they come up with schemes. Uh, uh, in the meantime, consumers, much more empowered, much more in control. You can do more things on these laptops that are here than uh, you could do driving around in a car or bus, you know, 10 years ago and on the phone. You can do them right from where you sit. The whole way you do business. And so the consumers are very much empowered. The way people send money around, transformation. You go to more and more places that don't even take checks. And uh, the way people send money. We'll talk about a few of those in a minute. Shifting demographics. The aging uh, uh, baby boomers. Uh, the Gen Ys who are a lot like the baby boomers in some ways and very different from them in others. The, technical, uh, the advances that come in technology, overwhelming. We'll try to touch on a few of those. And uh, non-traditional players, a new entrance. If you really sleuth through, you'll find that to Walmart uh, offers debit cards. They tried to get a banking charter in Utah, and that was, uh, that was uh, stopped by lobbyists, and et cetera, because they didn't want Walmart. How would you like to pe compete with Walmart? They sell one-fifth of the nation's groceries. How would you like to be a financial institution and compete against all their locations and all the people who do business with them? So they were kept out of getting that industrial charter here in Utah. Well, they do business with, and in Mexico they have checking accounts and savings accounts and auto loans, and they're doing business down there, financial institution business in Mexico. Here in the States, they have a company called Green Dot that they uh, uh, now have an equity interest in. And Green Dot supplies them with their debit cards that they use to pay employees and do other things with. Well, Green Dot has just filed, and uh, their uh, filing, waiting for it to be approved, includes intention to purchase Bonneville Bank, right here. Most of you probably don't know that. <laughs> uh, this, that deal's set to close sometime this year. It's not a done deal, but uh, they're looking to get into the, uh, into the financial markets right here in Utah. So a lot of things change. Uh, you try to figure out the landscape and uh, you know, what's the future going to look like. How do you do business? How do you start a business? How do you keep a business uh, profitable? And uh, there's a, just a big seismic shift in the whole financial landscape. And for those of you interested or have a career 
it's just going to be a whole different uh, uh, scenario for us. Uh, I just want to talk about four macro forces that are reshaping the financial services, and they're brutal. Uh, they're really strong. They run deep. And anyone who ignores any of these uh, does so at their own peril, if you're running a business or a company or anything else. Uh, the economy, navigating uh, what's going to be the new normal. Uh, uh, the economy that has churned and, 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 and done so well for decades here uh, is slowing down as it uh, interacts with a world or global economy. Uh, forces outside of this country have a big impact on our businesses and how we do business. And it's going to slow down and, and, and some say it's going to stay a little bit slower. It's never going to see some of those glory days. And uh, things that used to work, balances that used to uh, keep things running, don't work anymore. Uh, companies overloaded with debt or regulation or whatever else, and things that used to be uh, okay they just don't seem to function the way they used to. Uh, the graph here shows you the tendency for Americans to be in debt. Credit's so easy to get. That's easier to get than a driver's license, it seems like, and uh, so you can see the growing debt there. That pale blue at the far right, you can see what's grown. That shows you that emphasis on home ownership and the debt that people had in terms of mortgages. And it's going to be a while deleveraging that and getting those homes resold again. And people were in homes who really couldn't afford to be there. The thought was, though, well, if you don't have enough raise to grow into this payment in two, three years, certainly by then, and worse comes to worse, you sell your house and you make 100000 because look at the values. Well, what's the reality? <laughs> you know, it's something like 70% of the homes in America okay, have gone down in value. And for mortgages out there, there's a huge percent of homes, 30, 25, 30 percent of the homes that are worth less than what the mortgage balance is. Anybody here in that case? You don't have to raise your hand. But uh, some of you do, yeah. Most people in Utah, the home value has gone down about 20 to 25 percent. And if you just got a mortgage in the last four or five years, you probably owe more on your house than what it's worth if you were to try to sell it today. Okay? And so, this recession has forced people to come to grips with this, and uh, we see that there uh, is great deleveraging happening, mostly because of the rising unemployment. In Utah, we're 7.3 percent. Uh, Utah County, 7.4. And we were, uh, two and a half years ago, 2.3 percent unemployment. We couldn't find people to work for us. You had to fight over someone to start. No training necessary, just can you come here and learn be to be a teller? And, uh, of course, that's, that's changed nowadays. Well, uh, so consumers are shedding debt. How, uh, how, do you, how do you shed debt? How do, how do you do what's been showing in this graph? How do you do that? I will, uh, I've got goodies here so we can get some answers, because I know you know this, but this is a uh, portfolio with a binder or whatever else. Whoever can answer. What's one, one way of getting rid of debt? Spend less? That's not the American way. We typically have been spending 105% of what we've been earning for several years. Okay? Uh, what's another way to get rid of debt? Where was that bankrupt comment? There you are. You want to come and get this after? <laughs> I try to throw it up there, but there's people. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I went past the green mark, so, so the camera missed me. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, bankruptcy. They're, they're, uh, they're growing. And every time someone declares bankruptcy, if it's you, if the business that they owe, you're losing money. And so wealth disappears, their life, their credit gets ruined. And uh, that's another way. But they're going to deleverage. We see that happening. It's tough to make. Auto loans, auto loans are 3.74%. And they can't sell new cars enough to keep most of their salesmen in business. Uh, we've seen that locally. People are driving older cars. They're driving their car they have longer. They're fixing it up. Mechanics are doing great in the recession. Uh, new car dealerships, yeah, life is not too good there, okay. So uh, consumer uh, credit card debt is its lowest in eight years. That's like a miracle. Uh, so these are some dynamics. So you know what we go through at the credit union there. Uh, you see 2006, the red bar is loan growth. 
and they were part of it. People were borrowing, buying all kinds of things and doing stuff, fixing up their houses. And then he saw it change and they got scared and the market started acting up and so there's a flight to safety and they're saying, well, the, the deposits at the credit union and local banks the same way are insured. I'm taking my money out of the stock market. I'm going to put it where I know it's safe and it's insured. And so you see the green bars. Look at the growth. We had in 2009, in the first three months, $90 million of deposits came in from our members because they wanted to have it where it was safe. And so they're not spending it, and uh, they're trying to work their way out of debt. Smart thing to do, but it messes up the dynamics of a financial institution. Because like say we have $200 million that normally would be loaned out to members, they're not borrowing it, and so now it's in the markets earning 0.3% you know, or whatever. So there's some key economic trends. The recovery will be moderate, the risk will remain there. Some still worry about, they, uh, economists that I had from the uh, EBER say that there's probably around 20 to 25 to 30% chance that we'll have the double dip recession. It's moving more away from that. Core inflation will remain subdued throughout the 2010 and 2011. The government is intent on that happening. And they've made it very clear, even at the last meeting, that they said, we're going to keep the rates low, we're going to make money, we're going to keep buying our own debt, we're going to keep buying uh, treasuries, and, and uh, we'll keep the rates low. How does that work? If they're buying all the U.S. debt that's out there, and, and who's, how are we financing the deficit? I wasn't going to talk about this, but how are we financing the deficit? What's that? With more debt, okay, so if, you're, if you have debt, someone's loaning you the money. Who's loaning us the money? If we're out of money, who's loaning it to us? China, okay, in a bunch of countries. Uh, China, yeah. Uh, they are something like $865 billion worth of, of our debt they own. Um, and so we want them to keep buying our debt. So what, is the, what does the Fed policy have to do with that? Why is it they're buying treasuries? Why is, why are, if, if China wants to buy them in other countries, why is the government buying its own treasuries? To keep the rate, interest rates down? If people don't, uh, if, uh, if their uh, countries stop buying, like if you, if you were a company, would you buy Greece, you know, treasuries are, uh, from Greece or Portugal right now? No, you wouldn't do that. So for them to be able to, to borrow, they've got to sell these treasuries, they have to raise the rate that they'll, or the yield that you'll get, okay? They've got to raise the yield that you'll get because they've got to coax you to take that debt. And so that takes, uh, that takes all, the, uh, all the rates up. And so they want to keep mortgage rates low. And by uh, the steps they're taking, they're going to keep the rates low so money is easier to get because the economy is sagging. You worry then when it gets heating up too much and money's too easy to get and everybody's borrowing it and they're hiring and business is doing well, then you worry about what? Inflation, okay? Um, the Fed funds rate will remain unchanged during this period of time, so at least for a couple years. Uh, it will take many years to revert to any kind of normal. The consumer deleveraging will continue. And people get to more sensible levels of debt. And uh, try to maintain that delicate balance um, that keeps businesses thriving and, uh, and keeps families going. There'll still be some bailouts. We're not done with all of that. The things that we thought have always relied on working. Uh, Congress is going to take on uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae this next uh, session. Uh, that's, they're the companies that were buying all the bad mortgage debts. And they're losing money every day, every minute. And they got their hand into the U.S. Treasury and every month, the limit of the amount of money they're getting help from to, to buy all those debts and handle them and to absorb the losses associated with them keeps going up. Uh, consumers are rebuilding their financial lives. Uh, this is the U.S. Work, uh, workers that are showing their lower confidence in their chances of retirement when they wanted to. And you can see the decline and how many people are, are looking for jobs. And so um, those macro forces that are shaping it. Well, let's talk a little bit about the social. The population aging. This is a phenomenon that uh, if there's classes taught here that, that we don't totally understand the impact of this on the economy. But uh, we see two converging population waves. There's a growing uh, uh, younger uh, population group, the Gen Ys and others, and then there's the baby boomers that are hitting retirement. Big impact. The, this is the uh, population in blue, or those in the U.S. that are over 65 years of age. And then the percentage of the U.S. population that's uh, 
in percents. So 20%. Uh, you look in Utah, 9% because we have a lot of kids here, a lot of families, but in St. George, you got 18% of the population is over 65. And that population is growing very quickly. Uh, these are some uh, things about Utah's elderly. The sixth fastest growing uh, growth rate in the nation for people age 65 and older. People like to retire here. People like to stay here when they finish their careers. And you can see those others. It's just a really, in Utah, for doing business, people who understand this and are able to manage it uh, have great opportunity in the state. In Utah, one person will turn 65 years old every 23 minutes in 2015. So the end of retirement as we know it, uh, those 20, 30 years of just having le uh, leisure, uh, people are trying to find out new ways uh, to make money and stay active. And uh, there's only so many Walmart greeter jobs. <laughs> okay. So you can see for Utah. Uh, the makeup of the generations, uh, which we had time to go over this in more detail, what that means to a business, like in our business, and how we present, and how you stay relevant to a changing kind of sociology, and uh, what they demand. You know, we have a... We have a, a goal to be up, our, our, our network and our systems and our personal branch and our phones and all the electronic systems. The goal is 99.8%. Sounds really high? That's low. If you don't hit at least 99.8%, you're always down. And so the expectations are really high from the growing generation for things to, to go smooth. So you've got to do things. This is a, for college aides that we have, a Money Smart program that helps them learn about m money and managing it. One of the interesting things in, in America is we've been really good at teaching people how to make money. We haven't done a very good job of teaching people how to manage money. And so rather than learning that in the school of hard knocks by losing money and bankruptcy and those kinds of things, to the degree that we can have a generation that not only learns how to make money, but also knows how to manage it and be smart with that is a real benefit. And then, and then this is the group, the upcoming generation, that will transform everybody the way that everyone does business. And they're going to represent 34.3% of the population. And that's how they talk. I still don't know what that means. Somebody explained it to me once, but... Uh, so I hope there's nothing <laughs> bad that's in there. If there is, uh, we'll just skip that. But a uh, whole new set of tools of how they do and how they approach life. How they manage money, how they buy things. And uh, that was just a Be Money Smart uh, program that we have in place. If it'll go back, I guess it won't. Um, they teach kids. It gives them rewards for good grades, gives them rewards for making deposits, learning about interest and stuff like that. So hopefully they grow up uh, with a, a wiser sense of money. Okay. Technology. Five key technology trends that impact financial services in our business and because uh, there'll be things that you'll relate with. And internet-driven continuum of connectivity. People are, you know, you look here, any one of you here with those can, can connect into an internet, get information, find directions to the nearest uh, Einstein bagels or whatever. Are they still in business? And uh, you have, you're just always continue, continually connected and you expect to be. Uh, payment systems undergoing long-lasting change, the way people move money. And we'll, we'll touch on that in a bit. Uh, see, for, for uh, financial institutions, number two is a big deal. Uh, how do you stay in the loop? Who needs a credit union or a bank if I can move money and invest it and buy and make payments and stuff without them? Why do I need to have an account? And the emergence of mobile as a mainstream delivery channel. How many here have done something mobile just today? Yeah. See, most of the hands go up. Un undreamt of five years ago. Exponential growth in social media. We'll touch on that, the way people... I've got a son that's in a band, and whenever they come into Utah, there's not one advertisement, you don't hear anything, and yet all these people show up because Facebook. That's how you advertise. You don't buy, you know, uh, radio spots, or, or uh, you don't buy, put posters up on the lamp posts and stuff like that anymore. You know, the social media, the way people stay connected is really powerful. And a substantial increase in the required level of IT investments. You're going to have to spend a lot of money. If you're going to run a business, be prepared to spend a lot of money and focus a lot of time. Because if it's not best of breed stuff you're buying, people will pass you by and go to somebody else who has a better, quicker, uh, more connected system. 
And so we find that one of the biggest budget outputs we have every year is, it's like, for us, it's the green box, one of our strategies, is to have best of breed technology. And you spend a lot of money, as much money every year as it would take to build a branch you spend on IT. And that's just to stay up. Uh, technology transforming the world, you can see in, since 2000, 2005, and 2010, the growth in internet use, the storage demands. Look at the market value of Apple. Why didn't we buy Apple in 2000? Number of broadband users worldwide. So welcome to the digital age. It's transforming financial services. It's in the midst of a paradigm shift about money. We'll touch on a couple of the majority of customers' interactions will go online this decade. How many of you do your financial uh, uh, transactions, financial planning stuff online? Say by far the majority, if not 80% of this group. And 10 years ago, you know, it was kind of this dream. In 95, when we had first, uh, we were the first to put uh, online banking on our system. We weren't sure if it was a gamble, it was going to pay off or not. We really didn't know. And look at the history. Uh, the further development of online delivery channels is a required strategy for any, any business. Uh, new channels are emerging in the forms of mobile banking and social networks. And uh, we just uh, got a system that's coming online for us that's true texting. We have texting now, mobile, but you just type in BAL, it'll send you back all the balances on all the accounts you want. And, and, the, and the technology is there so you can do that from all different financial institutions and tie that all together. So if you're at the checkout stand and want to make sure if that check's going to, or that check, or transaction's going to clear, you can find out immediately those kinds of things. Uh, beware because there's opportunities for non-traditional firms to penetrate the market. I talked to you about Walmart and uh, PayPal. PayPal's growing faster than eBay is. PayPal's becoming a payment service and you see PayPal growing and they have plans to be uh, one of the PayPal players. So there's 1.7 billion people online. I hear over 90% of people in the world have access to online to the internet. So that includes a lot of countries where you maybe wouldn't think that would be so. <clears throat> okay, being digital, look at the things that's uh, involved with that. The, the chips, we have companies around here, Adobe's coming to our to our neck of the woods, uh, I am Flash is up there, but things are being automated. And uh, uh, there's even technology out there that your car will sense traffic in front and it'll warn you, and if you don't do anything about it because you're asleep, it'll slow you down. In fact, it'll even stop the car <laughs> and turn to try to avoid the wreck and those kinds of things that are, that are coming from this digital age. I uh, won't take any more time on that particular slide, but uh, Here's the continuum over time of how fast technology changes. You get a sense for how quickly things get old, and that was yesterday, that's old news, and you look what's happening. And there's just this exponential curve in the new stuff that's coming online. So recession or not, the exciting part about it is, is you're going to be involved in this kind of a curve. The opportunity out there is endless, it's amazing. The opportunities for you to accomplish things, to dream up things and do things that will move this curve along. And so there's great opportunity there. Referred to as internet pace and how it changes things. Is there anybody here who's never even touched a roll of film, the actual film from Kodak in your life? Is anybody? Okay, not too many. Uh, boy, did this industry change. And it used to be that the classic story here was B.F. Goodrich, who used to make buggy whips. And, uh, and they were, uh, uh, several companies did that. They're the only one who went from buggy whips to tires, and so they were still around. Well, we got new case studies, Eastman Kodak. They've laid off tens of thousands of people. They're coming around to the digital age, but too slow. And uh, look how it changed. Because now, instead of getting the film, shooting the camera, taking it then, hoping it turned out, having uh, five of the 20 shots not even turn out because the light wasn't right and all those kinds of things, you were stuck with them anyway. Now look what happens. You know, take the pictures, you look, there's a lot of different companies. Uh, we wanted a granddaughter, my wife wanted some pictures of our granddaughter in Pennsylvania. Um, and so rather than you know, taking the pictures and sending, uh, getting them printed, sending them to us, five days later we get in the mail this album book <laughs> from Walmart. And it's our granddaughter. And everything she'd done since she was born, you know, in one little book. 
and that's how you do photo albums. And rather than having a stack of, of uh, photo albums stacked someplace in the plastic uh, albums that you never look at, you know, and, and this is, uh, I'm talking like this is really cool. Most of you are going, duh, that's old news. You know, secretary, when I'll ask for a phone number once in a while, and I expect her to go to the top left drawer where we keep the phone books. She's never looked at a phone book in, you know, 10 years. This is not how she is. She goes right immediately to the internet. And so it's a paradigm shift of how business changes. And so you got to keep up with that. I'm having trouble getting this to change. Okay. The digital age uh, changes traditional business models. Uh, people, uh, the mail pieces are, are way down. And uh, people text. I've seen people text each other when they're sitting by each other because it's too much hassle to call or talk or turn your head. You know, it's easier to just text. And, and uh, some people worry about that, but look at the way the music industry has changed. It used to be location, location, location. The number one driver for where people have checking accounts is convenience of the branch. Well, guess what's changing? I mean, that was a, one of the commandments of financial industries, and that's changing. Now it's technology, technology, technology. Make it easy for me to do banking or I'll find somebody else who does. It's that simple. And so uh, a lot of things from uh, paper changing, electronic impulses. Here's the online household, the growth of them. It's, uh, that's violent change in the, uh, in the financial industry. This is one of our web pages. We just uh, purchased. This is the next uh, web page you're going to see at Utah Community Credit Union. And you'll see, uh, we don't have time to talk about all the features of it, but you'll see this uh, pie chart. It shows you where your spending categories are and how much you spend on groceries or whatever else. And it's got another one that shows you on the right side your budget. And if you're doing okay, and if you get, uh, it's green. If you're getting close to your budget amount, it's yellow. And if you went over, it's red. And it's immediately updated online, real-time banking. Um, people are going to demand that. We think it's really cool. It is. But people are going to demand that. Uh, pay bills. You can pay bills overnight. You can uh, pay, uh, hook up uh, everything from, from uh, church donations to, uh, to all your utilities and never have to worry about it. And then if, there, if one's presented and you don't have money for it, you can have an alert come and a text will come to you saying, hey, this bill was presented, you don't have enough for it. Then you can get on your mobile device, transfer money over and take care of it. It's just a whole different uh, approach. Making deposits online. Uh, you can do that now. The technology is out there. We have it uh, purchased and it will be online this in 2011 with a scanner or with your iPhone. Take a picture of the check front and back, push a button, and you just made a deposit. You rip up your check. So uh, households are coming along and it's surprising how many of the baby boomers are adopting this. It's tougher work for them and it's harder to change the way you think, but they're adopting it at a really high rate. For you guys, it's just, uh, just the way you think. So online households have migrated toward this, and it's the way the future is. So here's the number of new branches built in financial industry. This is banks and credits and savings and loans. So they're built spending less money on branches because you don't really care if there's branches there or not. You like to have some, and the Generation Y like to have a branch so they can go in case everything else falls apart, they can go talk to a person. It's a big deal to them. Uh, look how that Im impacts business. Barnes & Noble, how many people buy books anymore? And so for them to not be like Kodak has become, they come out with Nook. And now you can buy Nook and you got 125,000 uh, volumes that are free and they can buy cheaply any of the new stuff that comes out. Who would ever thought that that would replace books in the library? And so we basically, you know, and say, well, the credit union is really going to be what you're holding on your lap there. That's how you're going to access financial institutions, how you're going to buy stuff, how you're going to move money around, plan your life, uh, talk to your friends, and that's just uh, the way it is. So, social networking as it grows, we talked a little bit about that. And we uh, interact with people we normally wouldn't see together, and you befriend people that you normally wouldn't be around. And uh, people have become friends that wouldn't uh, meet in regular social circles or, or go to the same uh, environments where they'd maybe meet. Uh, this is a fun one because, especially if you see that, <laughs> sometimes people want to turn off Facebook and they sometimes share too much and there's lawsuits about how much Facebook makes available about you to other people. Well, those are growing pains and part of this uh, phenomenon there. Uh, and people worry about you. 
because uh, they're worried, you know what, I'm afraid people aren't going to know how to talk to each other, to sit down and have a face-to-face. -face. How are they going to fall in love? How are they going to talk to people? Because all they do is this texting, and this guy was so busy friending people, he never made any friends while he was out at school. Interesting. Uh, this recent survey, though, because there's uh, warning signs about that, this is the degree to which people trust blogs and a lot of the stuff that's out there on the net. So if we're going to use the Internet as an institution, to uh, advertise or to inform or to educate. People got to be, we've got to do something so that they trust it. Right now, the level of trust is pretty low. And so we want to make ourselves different from everybody else. Uh, think of a number between 1 and 10. Okay. Multiply the number by 9. If you have a two digit number, add them together. Subtract 5 from that number. Match your number with the corresponding letter of the alphabet. So A would be 1, a 2 would be a B, etc. Match your number with a letter of the alphabet. Okay. Name a European country in your mind that begins with that letter. Now go to the next letter of the alphabet. Think of an animal beginning with that letter. What do you have? Interesting. You ever go to a site and they say, people like you who bought this also bought this, and they recognize you from being there before, and they know what the next thing is? I and mean, this is an amazing field and exciting for you to be part of that and the things that you can do. And that's where the country's going then with, with technology. Anyway, that's kind of fun. So for every face that's out there, for every kind of situation, technology is going to have an impact with all of that. The disruptors. Google. Android is growing faster than the Apple. The iPhone is really big in Utah, a uh, bigger market share here than, than a lot of places. But the die seems to be cast for uh, Google. Uh, not only the value, but the things that they're getting into and the things that they're doing. Uh, they were really smart in their approach to communication devices. AT&T, Verizon Wireless, PayPal, talked about them. They're fast becoming a payment system uh, in the world. Mint just got bought by Intuit, and uh, they're going to be putting PayPal, Intuit, and home banking stuff together. We're watching this conglomeration. It's going to be really powerful. Mint right now is free. But this allows you to uh, handle all your finances, update balances immediately. And uh, you know, Bill Gates said something interesting. We need to move money around, but we don't need to have banks or credit. So, so our, our job is to stay relevant. Your job in your business and in your industry that you'll be in will to stay relevant with people. You've got to matter. You've got to stay relevant. You've got to stay in the loop. And remote deposit capture is one of the newest things that's coming down the pike for us. That's where you can make a copy of a check and deposit it. A retail chip that uh, you just have your card, and uh, it's, uh, it's embedded in, in, if you have your, I don't have my cell phone to show you, but because uh, Dave took it from me. But if you have a cell phone, there's chips in it, and you go to the store, and you put your stuff that you're going to buy, you wave your phone, by, uh, by the reader there, and your grocery bill, your gas bill, your candy bill, or your hamburger bill, your Coke bill, whatever else comes with your telephone bill, it's all managed together. That's out there. Uh, this, is what, this was the first card in the United States that had all the features. This is the UVU Plus card that we've done with, with the university here. It has a chip in it, a mocha chip, that allows you to write UTA. It has an approximate antenna around it that allows you to access to the PE buildings and stuff like that. Plus, it's a Visa card, a debit a check card, and plus, it's your student ID, all wrapped into one. And that's just the beginning of what's going to happen with technology as we go forward. Zash Pay, we have that now. You, wanna, you owe your buddy 20 bucks on your cell phone, you can send him 20 bucks. They receive it, and they can put it wherever they want to have that go. And then once it's set up, all you have to do is just pay them person to person. And uh, you won't have to send it in the mail, or you can't keep dodging them saying you forgot it. You know, you have to pay them because you have it. Uh, let's look at uh, um, the uh, regulation. And hurry with this. He, these are, who, 
who are uh, got a, some flashlights here. I'll give out to who's the top left corner. Who is that? Is he uh, going to show up in Congress next year? No. Why come? I don't dare throw this; it'll break. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Why is he called the disruptor in the financial services? The F Frank Dodd bill that just passed, overhauling financial services. We call it the fraud bill, fraud, Frank Dodd, because uh, it does uh, some of the things it does. Who's in the middle? Who said that? This is yours, okay? Barney Frank, who's in the bottom right-hand corner? Great. Good job. She's lesser known. Two weeks ago, I was in the same room with her. She scared me to death. She's going to be uh, the, part of the, the fraud bill, the, or the Frank Dodd bill, was uh, they, they created a new bureau. It's going to be an agency, Consumer Financial Protection Agency. Now it's going to be the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, partly because Congress now has no control over how much money they have. It's going to come directly from the Treasury. It can be a very powerful organization. President Obama wants her to be in charge of it, but she's a very outspoken consumer advocate. Part of that's good, but she goes so far, it scares a lot of people, and even the Democrats don't want to confirm her in the Senate, and so she was appointed interim special assistant to the President so she can start up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And um, she's, she, you know, she's told us about you. She said, the average American's consumer does not have, and these are her words, the cognitive ability to decide whether a checking account or a card or financial services is, is good or not. She's convinced that the government has to decide that because you don't have the cognitive ability. And it upsets me because I know very well how smart consumers are and how great and how bright they are. But uh, there's some of the people who are, who are having a lot of impact on our, on our world. Uh, the way checking accounts uh, uh, and some of the laws that impact that, I tell you, the days of free checking are probably numbered because there's laws out there saying, you know what, NSF fees are bad for these people. They're all avoidable, but NS NSF fees are bad. So we're going to pass a law that you can only have w charge one a month, six in a year. That hasn't passed yet, but that's one of the bills out there. And so that means everybody will just get their checking accounts closed on them. You can't afford to do business. It costs money to, to run these. And so we may see annual, our monthly checking fees come back, annual, annual fees on cards as a part of all this uh, consumer stuff that's happening, limitations on these things. Well, bring it all together here. Uh, anybody know what this is? <laughs> Some of you may not. There's a funny story of a colleague of mine. It's just like not too long ago, I was with a group of youth talking about a cassette player. And there were kids in high school who had never seen, didn't know what a cassette was. Maybe some of you are the same way. I don't know. I couldn't believe it. Well, a colleague of mine was driving down. Uh, he was in Boston, and he was lost. And if you've ever driven in Boston, it's tough to find your way around in Boston. A lot of one-way streets. And so they were, he was motioning to this car of girls next to them you know, as he pulled up beside them to roll down their window. And uh, after about the third light, they didn't do anything. And finally, one of them went like this because <laughs> they didn't know what he was doing. And they realized they don't know what that means. <laughs> and so uh, then he uh, went like that on, you know, to push down a button. And of course, then the, the window of the BMW full of girls opened up and then he got some directions. But a lot of things are changing and a lot of things are going to be different. But I, as, as a, yes, we're in a recession. Yes, times are tough. But I look at that as a real opportunity for you. You're bright, you're smart, you're at a great institution, you have a great opportunity to learn about this, and as you go uh, forward, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for you, um, no matter what your background. But uh, so along with all of the things that we worry about, there's, there's great opportunity there. Are there any questions? Uh, thanks for letting me be here today with you and talk about some of the things. Any questions anybody has about anything? Yes? Well, part of that software, so the question was, if you have someone deposit a check in Minnesota and they send it here, how do you know that somebody's not going to present that at one of your branches or the real check comes through or whatever? And so part of it is the software set up so that that check number, that amount, and the payee all gets recorded. And so if that ever gets presented someplace else, it'll find it. It's technology again.
Well, we'd certainly like to thank uh, Mr. Jeff Servan for showing up today and for his very interesting presentation. Um, I think it's a testament to the interest in your presentation that even though it's time to run, most people stayed until you finished what you had to say. So thank you very much. We appreciate our partnership with UCCU over the years and, and looking forward to it continuing in the future. Thank you. Good luck.